This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Here's your host, Brandon Contes. All righty, welcome to episode 65 of the Awful Announcing Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Contes, and this week we are joined by Jim Lampley. Jim, who spent 30 years as an announcer for HBO Boxing. Now you can catch him contributing to ppv.com which is where he's going to be Saturday for Canelo Alvarez versus Edgar Berlanga. Jim, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. You were away from the sport for about five years after HBO moved on from, from boxing. Now you've, you've been back for a year with PPV.com. How has the last year been, the opportunity to be involved with boxing again? Another fun learning experience, um, a different way of communicating with the audience during the five-year um, absence that you discuss. Part of that time, I was teaching a course here at the University of North Carolina, my alma mater. Uh, and the title of the course was Evolution of Storytelling in American Electronic News Media. Uh, some of the principles that I taught in the course extend beyond news media to sports media. And one of those principles is, and I recited it to my students many times, evolution of various different systems relative to electronic communications, particularly evolution in electronics, evolution in personnel, evolution in uh, business structures and financing, et cetera, et cetera, can ultimately lead to differences in the way that stories are told. Here's a perfect and graphic example for them. PPV.com is a new enterprise in which, uh, along with three other supposed experts, uh, I say supposed experts, they're experts. I'm supposedly an expert. But at any rate, the four of us sit at ringside, watch the fights, and participate in a live chat stream with each other. And audience members who are watching the fights can also opt into the chat stream and comment along with us or push back at us. It's a whole new thing. Uh, and when I was asked to do it, you know, I was... Um, I was reconciled to the idea that I wasn't going to be doing any blow by blow anymore. This isn't blow by blow. It's a different way of commenting on the fight. Uh, and it's been tremendous fun for me to do this for the first year. Has it, um, ha has it been enough to, to like fill the void for you or, or does it only make you want to get back into broadcasting and, and calling fights more? <laughs> well, certainly it fills the void with regard to my travel schedule. Uh, it puts a paycheck in a place where no paycheck existed for, uh, four years. Um, it, you know, brings him back into the media room and, uh, into personal contact with the fighters and their, uh, surrounding support people, managers, trainers, promoters, et cetera, et cetera. So all that is good. Um, would I rather be doing blow by blow on one of the streaming services? Nobody asked me to. So the simple fact that I was not asked uh, is sufficient to say, all right, do something else. And uh, when PPP.com came along and offered the opportunity, uh, I jumped at it because, again, it's a new way of telling the story. It's, um, it's cooperative and participatory. There are three other people who are doing it at the same time that I do it. I respect them all. Uh, so it's been a fun way of branching out at the end of my career. And you're no longer teaching at UNC? Uh, I, when I started doing BPB.com, I decided to take a break from teaching because uh, the, the workload for BPB.com is more than I had at first imagined. You know, when, when first the deal was offered, I'm thinking, okay, I go to the fights and I comment on the fights. I didn't really realize at first that there would be so much promotional uh, activity relative to this. Makes all the sense in the world. We're trying to build something <laughs> new. But by far the biggest time expenditure is dealing with people like you and, uh, and getting the opportunity to continue talking boxing uh, in various other electronic media, such as this one. So uh, all of that has been great, and uh, I enjoyed a lot. What made you want to get into teaching? Because you, you were not teaching when you were with HBO, correct? That that just started. No, I, I didn't start teaching until I was finished with HBO. Um, 
it's a long story how I wanted to get back into teaching and everybody can read about it in my autobiography. Uh, it happened, which will be published by Ben Bella Books sometime early in this coming next year. But uh, as briefly as possible, I'm a person who could easily have um, flunked out from the University of North Carolina. I came within a whisker of doing that. I treated my first a uh, couple of years of undergraduate school, terribly irresponsibly. Uh, and then eventually I found myself in a kind of academic life or death situation. And I, uh, I had to buckle down and spend the last two years of my academic career really grinding and taking overloads. And um, I had to make long strings of consecutive A's to avoid flunking out because I had come so close to flunking out at the beginning of the process. And eventually, uh, not only did I go to graduate school here, but I was invited. I was given a chance to go to graduate school by the chairman of the radio, television, motion pictures department who had seen my work during the last year and a half or so of my undergraduate career and said, you know, uh, you should keep polishing the apple you've developed because now you've proven you're a great student and I want you to keep proving it and do something more. I think he might have anticipated that I would wind up on the faculty, but instead uh, I wound up being chosen out of a national talent hunt to be the first person to stand on the sidelines of a college football game with a camera and a microphone in 1974. And that, um, that sojourn as the first sideline reporter uh, was the beginning of what became my 45 plus year career in network television. Um, that, so that, that's interesting that you, you didn't go to school uh, aspiring to be a, a sportscaster necessarily. I was an English major. Yeah, uh, and uh, and I uh, aspired to read books, and uh, I I was a, an overwhelmingly devoted sports fan, and I could talk sports uh, at length with anyone. But um, no, I that wasn't what I was thinking of doing. And then when I finally got my undergraduate degree, uh, I was offered a chance to volunteer in the press office of a political campaign. Uh, and, and the campaign was for the United States Senate here in North Carolina. And I wound up being the chief press aide to uh, the United States Congressman who was running for the Senate. And when ultimately we lost that race, I was uh, at, you know, at a loss for what to do next. And that's when the chairman of the radio, television, motion pictures department said, come to graduate school, uh, this will help you to continue polish what you've polish polishing what you've done so far. And uh, from there, I got to work at WCHL radio. I got to work at University of North Carolina football and basketball radio network. I did the Dean Smith show. I had a talk show of my own here in Chapel Hill. And all those credentials were under my belt before I went to interview for the college age reporter job. Uh, with ABC in 1974. So as a as a professor now, um, were were most of your students aware and familiar with your career? Some. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that I could say most. I think, you know, during the first semester I was teaching, probably word got around. So uh, there were more of them as time went by. But at the beginning, I think the vast majority of my students didn't have a clue. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had to explain to them or um, someone in the department explained to them, no, no, th this is the most experienced broadcaster on the campus. So if you want to work in television or radio broadcasting or digital uh, expression, he's the right person to talk to. So I spent a great deal of time uh, having meetings in my office just offering personal guidance to people. Yeah. And then eventually I had a mentee, uh, a young woman who was very determined to begin her career as a sideline reporter and who had gone on the web. 
She was at the University of New Hampshire. She went on the web and discovered that the very first sideline reporter ever on network television was teaching at the University of North Carolina. So she transferred here to be with me and uh, she has graduated and is out there uh, beating the bushes for a job right now. Is there is there one question that most of the students were are, are, are eager to ask you when they when they meet with you? Like, is there something whether it's about your career or whether it's about furthering their career? Is there something that like every every student that becomes like a redundant question that they ask you? How do I get on the air? Uh, and uh, and I had to make clear to many of them that uh, it might be better for their ambitions to lie elsewhere rather than on the air. And there are lots of other things to do. Uh, within the broadcasting business. You can yeah. be a producer, you can be a writer, you can be an associate producer, you can be a researcher. There are lots of different things to do which can advance your career. And oh, by the way, um, quite a number of the outstanding on-air people began working off the air uh, before somebody decided to put them in front of a camera or a microphone. And then you can also be working for ppv.com. Um, how, how did you how did you get involved with PPV? Like, like why were they the outlet that brought you back? Well, um, I think at the end of the day, they were a brand new medium, um, intelligently conceived because of the possible interaction between live chat and the live event and uh, the information that is uh, proceeding from the broadcast itself. Uh, all of that fit together, even though it had not been done before. And I think they were looking for, um, they already had a couple of uh, meaningful names, uh, Lance Pugmire, boxing scene, very well-known um, boxing writer and, uh, and a good one. Uh, Chris Algieri, welterweight fighter, uh, was working with them and, uh, they were looking for a bigger name that they could promote, uh, and also somebody who would be skilled at doing the thing that I'm doing with you right now. So, uh, they reached out to me and, uh, that was exactly one year ago. The very first fight I did was the Canelo fight last September. Uh, and now here I am getting ready to cover Canelo again. <laughs> When you signed off HBO in uh, in 2018, did you expect to hear from more outlets? Yes. Did but you? I did. Yeah. Um, were you surprised at that time when when HBO boxing ended? Yes, uh, I couldn't figure out then, and still can't figure out to this day why the cell phone salesman from Dallas who bought HBO. Uh, and Time Warner, for that matter, thought it was a good idea to get rid of what had been one of the most successful franchises uh, in the history of premium pay cable television uh, and one of the most successful franchises in broadcast television in general. Why in the world would you remove boxing from HBO? Because it drove subscriptions uh, in quite a number of different ways for a long time, and it helped create shoulder programming uh, around the fights, such as my series, The Fight Game, that ran for several years and helped to illuminate for people what was going on in the boxing world. No, I couldn't imagine why they wanted to get rid of it, and I still can't. So HBO Boxing at, at that time, it it was healthy, in your opinion. It's not like you were witnessing a demise the, the, uh, the couple years prior or anything like that? It still was helping to drive subscriptions. Uh, it, it still had, uh, significant audiences within the limitations of premium pay cable television. This is not broadcast television where you're available to everybody. People have to pay to see it. Uh, but you know, within, within the structure of HBO, it was still, as I understood it, a very successful franchise. The chairman of the board, Richard Plepler, uh, top of the pyramid in every way was just as shocked as I was that they wanted to get rid of boxing. And how did you find out about it? Did you hear or see rumors or, or were you yeah. just kind of blindsided by it? That summer I was at um, the, either the post Emmys or post golden globes party. 
at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. And I was seated at the chairman, Richard Plepler's table. And um, he pointed across the room and said, see that guy right there in the gray suit uh, over sitting at that table with the blonde woman? I said, yeah. He said, that's your new boss. That's the, uh, that's the boss of uh, uh, AT&T with regard to this enterprise. And he's going to be running um, this channel going forward. I think you ought to go over and say hello, meet him, get a feel for him, maybe get a sense of what it is they're planning with regard to the boxing franchise. So I did. I went over and I, uh, I met John Stanky and I spent 15, 20 um, pleasant enough minutes with John Stanky. I met his wife, uh, had a friendly conversation. I came back to Richard's table and he said, what do you think? I said, I think the boxing franchise is dead. I think they have no interest whatsoever in continuing to pursue it. He said, well, that's my impression too. I just wanted to be sure that I wasn't crazy, but if you and I agree, uh, then now we're going to find out whether we're right. And we were right. So I, I, I feel like I, I know the answer to this, but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. Who, who deserves more fault for the demise of HBO boxing now uh, with with HBO giving up on boxing five years ago, it was, well, six years ago now, um, HBO for not valuing boxing anymore, or we'll, we'll call it the the parent company for not valuing boxing anymore, or boxing for not making themselves valuable enough to HBO. I think this was purely an AT and T decision. Uh, I don't think there was any change in behavior or misbehavior or failure in the relationship with the boxing world that. Uh, that prompted this, I think, for whatever reason, and again, I don't know the reasons, uh, AT&T had decided that uh, either they didn't think it was an audience enhancement or they didn't want to deal with the rambunctious uh, and sometimes unpredictable entrepreneurialism of boxing uh, or if it didn't fit with how they wanted to be perceived. I have no idea, but it wasn't it wasn't HBO. It wasn't anybody at 1100 Sixth Avenue in New York. And to my knowledge, you know, I don't know of anybody in boxing other than perhaps some of the people who are involved at the current streaming services who would have said, oh, we want HBO out of here. Let's get rid of them. You know, if I were um, if I were in the universe of the zone right now, would I be happy that HBO went away? Yes. Uh, less competition for rights uh less competition aesthetically on the air so you know i could see how it would have been good for them and for other uh streaming services of their ilk but uh again what's a mystery to me is why at&t didn't want it and it was their decision not mine what was that final sign off like well it was emotional and i think if you look back at it you'll see that it was emotional and i had a long standing habit uh, deeply entrenched, and I fought against it. But many of my friends and colleagues used to say to me, don't fight against that. It's what people love about you, uh, that I sometimes got emotional on the air. And I, you know, if I look back at the sign off, which I haven't recently, I think there were either some lip trembling or some tears, you know, something to demonstrate how deeply I felt about losing that bond uh, going forward, losing day-to-day -day contact with Max and Roy, uh, losing day-to-day -day contact with all the people in the truck who were uh, uh, so devotedly supportive of our production all those years. There were lots of things about it that, uh, that were negative for me. Losing constant contact with the fighters. Many things uh, about it went wrong. You know, the very first live sports event I ever watched on network television because my mother sat me down when I was six years old and instructed me to watch it. it was Sugar Ray Robinson versus Bobo Olson for the middleweight championship in 1955. So my twice widowed mother um, gave me boxing and said, this is something you're going to do because if your father was still alive, he would want you to do it with him. Uh, and in the next 90 minutes, a man named Don Dunphy is going to tell you everything you need to know about boxing. 
the voice in my head all those years that I called fights was that of Don Dunphy. Precise, economical, understated, intelligent. He was the best. And I tried to follow in his footsteps. Did you want to take a break after HBO ended? Um, like, what, oh, was there I almost like a bit of a know. grieving process? Absolutely not. I wanted to go straight to some other streaming services, uh, announce position, and keep going back to the fights. So I wasn't ready to uh, to walk away and say goodbye. But it wasn't my choice. Yeah. And now looking back, how was the five-year break? <clears throat> how what? How was the five-year break looking back? Well, a lot of things went on. Uh, I permanently moved from... Um, San Diego to Chapel Hill, a huge percentage of my family, both my family and my wife's family, moved here to be with us. I taught for five semesters. Um, I'm back to doing all the things I um, scraped and uh, kicked and fought to do when I was an undergraduate and then later in graduate school, meaning that I have tickets to the basketball and football games. Uh, and I get to go sit and watch them uh, in good seats. My wife goes with me. Um, and, uh, and I have, you know, a lot of friends and, and a, a beautiful home in one of the most beautiful and lovable cities uh, or towns, if you want to be more accurate about it, uh, in America. I always loved Chapel Hill. I always thought deep in my heart, some way or another, I was going to come back. So all of that has played out pretty much exactly the way I would have wanted it to. Do you relate it all to Warner Brothers Discovery losing the NBA rights for TNT and everybody at inside the NBA knowing this is their last year? Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. And I can only imagine how the people who uh, have worked on the uh, TNT studio show, uh, Kenny, obviously, Otar Hill is a friend, uh, Ernie, uh, a colleague for a long, long time and someone I admire and respect, Barkley, uh, who somewhat uh, unexpectedly became a massive broadcasting star and phenomenon. Um, I feel very bad for them because I'm sure they thought, just as I did at Ringside for HBO, that that was never going to go away. Yeah. Um <clears throat> I've, you you mentioned when you you fell in love with boxing at a young age, it was still when, once you got into broadcasting, it was a few years before you started um, announcing boxing. Correct? Do you know this story? No. Huh. So, um, Cosell did boxing at ABC, and Barry Tompkins did boxing at HBO, and. By the time you get to 1987, and I've been at ABC for 13 years in 1987, um, I had never been anywhere near a boxing match. Uh, to do so would have incurred the ire of Howard Cosell, and that was the last thing you wanted to do. Um, and, and then uh, the network was sold, pretty much like HBO. Network was sold, and the new entity that bought the network was a station's ownership group named Capital Cities. Um, and they wanted to put their stamp on particularly the own station's division. And Rune Arledge was at that time running two divisions, news and sports. So Capital Cities went to Rune and said, doesn't make any sense for one man to be running both news and sports. Um, pick one. And he intelligently, for his legacy, chose sports. I mean, excuse me, chose news. So now they took the guy who had been running stations, uh, a man named Dennis Swanson, and moved him over to run sports. And Swanson arrived at ABC Sports with one basic predilection, which was Jim, uh, who is Jim Lampley and why are we paying him all this money? So within the first two or three weeks of his uh, tenure at ABC Sports, Swanson made clear to my agent that he was going to do everything possible to get me to walk away from my existing contract, and he was going to do nothing to further advance and elevate my career. Um, and gradually, over the course of the next few months, he did a variety of things that made that very clear. 
But the one unusual thing he did was to, in the wake of Cosell's departure, to assign me to boxing. He thought that given my personnel, personality type, my background, the way that I dressed, all the things that he observed about me, he thought there was no way in the world that Jim Lampley will understand boxing or that boxing will accept him. So he was assigning me to boxing for the purpose of trying to force me out of ABC Sports. He also didn't realize that the division had just recently signed a uh, get acquainted look-see contract with a 19-year-old heavyweight from New York whose name was Mike Tyson. And so the very first fight I ever called on ABC Sports, um, February of 1987, was Mike Tyson versus Jesse Ferguson. And uh, it was a spectacular showing by Mike. Uh, he obliterated Jesse's nose in the fourth or fifth round. There was blood all, all over the ring. Um, and in the post-fight interview with uh, the expert commentator, an executive named Alex Wallow, who Swanson also was trying to get rid of, uh, Alex asked Mike about the uppercut, and Mike said, Pat Namata taught me that the purpose of the uppercut was to drive the nose bone into the brain. I was trying to drive his nose bone into his brain. I was standing at ringside thinking, look at what I've happened on to here. This is astonishing. This kid is not only going to be the number one quote machine in boxing, he's going to be the number one quote machine in sports. And within the next few weeks, they all began rolling out. Boxing is a hurt business. Everybody's got a plan until you hit them, et cetera, et cetera. And I was Tyson's early curator uh, for the first few fights on ABC before I was forced to walk away. I took a job with CBS, uh, doing local sports at KCBS TV in Los Angeles, doing NFL football, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, not too long after that, HBO came to me and said, will you call our fights? They had signed a contract with Tyson. So that's really where my boxing career originated was in the heart and mind of Dennis Swanson. How can I embarrass Jim Lampley and force him to walk away from ABC Sports? Oh, I'll assign him to boxing. <laughs> Famous last words, right? Uh, so did you, first did you, did you garner the, the ire of Howard Cosell? I hope so. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I did because eventually I had a, um, a primetime interview show on uh, CBS, on the television network. And uh, the format of the interview show was that I would interview three people for 20 minutes each in a primetime hour and um, looking for a big name to put on the first show. <clears throat> I reached out using my uh, recorded address book, had the home number of Howard, I called Howard got him on the phone and asked him if he'd be a guest on my show. And the response was sufficient to, um, to let me know that yes, everything about me had incurred the ire of Howard Cosell, including the fact that I was now calling fights on uh, HBO. He was infuriated. Um, so that part was good. <laughs> Did you develop much of a relationship with Howard? Well, um, it was never really a positive relationship, but Howard had a magazine show on ABC during his last two or three years at the network. He had a show called uh, Sports Beat, which was a, uh, a Saturday afternoon magazine show. And the format of Sports Beat was that Howard would sit in the studio and at some point in the show do a live interview with Sonny Werblin, George Steinbrenner, uh, Al Davis, or one of his other close friends in the sports world. And in order for the show to be complete, somebody had to go out, travel, do a feature piece, um, do something that augmented what Cosell did in the studio. And Arledge chose me uh, to be the, um, Arledge chose me to be the uh, interviewer on the show. So I did. What was your relationship like with Muhammad Ali? Um, brilliant, fabulous, wonderful. Uh, I 
was an Ali fan from the first moment I saw Cassius Clay at the Rome Olympics in uh, the summer of 1960. He was uh, by far my biggest sports hero for a long period of time. The very first live prize fight I ever attended was Ali versus um, Sonny Liston, February 25, 1964 in Miami Beach. Uh, eventually we met, uh, I saw him a few times over the years and uh, at the 1991 United States Boxing Writers Dinner in New York, um, he was there to sign autograph copies. He was there to autograph books that had been written by Tom Hauser, a really great biography of him. I was there and I had my 11-year-old daughter with me. At one point, uh, I had to leave the media room and go do about an hour's worth of work. And I needed somebody to, in effect, sit with and occupy my 11-year-old daughter. And Muhammad insisted on doing that. So she spent that whole next hour with him um, and literally asked me in the car on the way back to her mother's apartment that night, dad, who was that guy? Uh, and, and that leads to a photograph that will appear in my book. But, uh, but the bottom line is, yes, I had a fantastic relationship with uh, Muhammad Ali. How was working with Max Kellerman? Uh, another fantastic relationship just as it was with Larry Merchant. They are both dear and headed toward lifetime friends uh, with me. And uh, I miss both of them uh, now that we're physically separated. Uh, I'm in North Carolina. Larry's in Los Angeles and Santa Monica. Not 100% certain at any given moment where Max is, but uh, I miss them a lot. Are you in touch with Max at all? I have contacted him a few times within uh, the period of time since um, uh, ESPN offloaded him, and um, I have not gotten much in the way of revelation from him gotcha. in those conversations. He's pretty close to the best. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's definitely just the fact that nobody has heard from Max publicly, at least in, in over a year. It's just, it's crazy for somebody that for, for decades you saw every day on television and on heard on the for radio. Somebody and, that talented for yeah. somebody that overwhelmingly gifted and intelligent for somebody who was so much better than so many of the people he worked with in a variety of circumstances. It makes no sense at all to me. Yeah. Um, also I, so I live on Long Island. I've been a, a WFAN listener my entire life. I was an on air yes. broadcaster to WFAN. How did that happen? Huh. Well, it was, uh, about the same time that Dennis Swanson was forcing me out of ABC sports and my agent, a Long Islander named Art Kaminsky, um, was going to work, finding me things to do. And he told me about, a gifted radio entrepreneur named Jeff Smullyan, who was creating a new radio format that was going to debut in New York and was looking for a big name host to help launch the station. Uh, and I became the person who was the first on-air talk show host for WFAN. And I kept doing it for a while after I went to Los Angeles for work to, to work for CBS. But then eventually it became a little too awkward for me to be doing a regular morning three or four hour talk segment talking about New York sports when I was living in Los Angeles. Yeah. Did you think it was a, a format that had the potential to be successful, the 24 hour radio format? Not only did I think that, but if you were to go back and find that first day, and I'm not sure if that can be done, but if you found the first day, you would find that for the first 30 or 45 minutes of that show, I did a very um, imaginative, uh, somewhat facetious, uh, attempted to be as extreme as possible in predicting what would happen uh, with that format. And at the end of the day, everything I predicted came true, up to and including that there would at some point be three different sports talk, 24-hour radio stations in Salt Lake City doing all jazz all the time. It happened. Uh, and uh, and a lot of other things that I predicted uh, that day happened uh, in the bizarre 
growth and evolution of 24-hour day sports talk radio. Um, do you think that Mike Tyson should be fighting Jake Paul later this year? <clears throat> well, should has nothing to do with, you know, it's my opinion is, is for me. And what really matters is what does Mike want to do? The audience loves him. The audience wants to see him. Jake Paul is a uh, creature of social media. I, to this day, do not participate in social media. I think you can tell that I'm basically old fashioned. Um, so, you know, it's it's not an event that appeals to me. And I, I wouldn't expect to see anything meaningful for a serious boxing critic or reporter. And um, the only reason I would watch it is in homage and loyalty to my very dear friend, Mike Tyson. Is Jake Paul good for boxing? No, because this is not going to be real boxing. This is not going to be a fight between two um, boxers who trained most of their lives within the technique of boxing and who are at or near their physical peak. That's not what we're talking about. Um, and as, as we finish up here, I, I'm curious, if do you think boxing would benefit from having its own version of, uh, of Dana White? Its own version of Dana White. What Dana White oh, is for the mean, UFC. Okay, if there was a, a rambunctious promoter impresario who gathers a great deal of power to himself and therefore has tremendous influence over which fights are made and how. Yeah. Isn't that what Turkey Al Al Sheikh is trying to do with Saudi money right now? Isn't that what Eddie Hearn is trying to do uh, via his distribution at? Um, at the zone, I, I think we have those people. Yeah. You know, whether one of them is going to become um, what Don King and Bob Arum were, I don't know. But yeah. we have um, certainly ambitious promoters who are trying to build huge names both for themselves and for the fighters whom they promote. Um, last thing, you you were involved with the Olympics. 14? It was 14 Olympics? 14 different Olympics, yes. How did you like calling that variety of sports? Well, about 85% of the time, I was a studio host. So uh, I, I love the Olympics. I've loved them ever since I watched them the first time in 1960 when I was 11 years old. Um, I very much wanted to be involved uh, in the Olympics when I was at ABC Sports. I got that privilege Ultimately, that led to um, all the other networks for whom I worked at the Olympics. Most of the time, uh, I was a studio host, so I wasn't locked to any one sport. And yes, you add it all up, all of those 14 uh, different cities and different trips and uh, all the athletes I met and all of the events that I uh, was privy to. Yeah, it's one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I think you know, no other sportscaster has had uh, that particular experience in the volume in which I had it. Jim, you were great. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I appreciate it. My privilege. Happy to be on Awful Announcing for the first time. That is Jim Lampley. I'm Brandon Contis. This is the Awful Announcing podcast. Please rate and subscribe to this podcast. Please also subscribe to Awful Announcing's YouTube page. But regardless of how you consume Awful Announcing and the Awful Announcing podcast, thanks for listening and be good. Thanks for listening to the Awful Announcing podcast. For the latest news spanning the sports media landscape and more, check out awfulannouncing.com and follow us at Awful Announcing.